Hello, I'm Ronnie Moore. You're very welcome. I'm delighted that you could join me here in my art studio. I'm going to show you step by step how I paint a watercolour landscape. If any of this is of use to you, which I'm sure it will be, please like the video as that'll be a great help. I'll be uploading more videos about different effects that I get and different techniques that I use. And so please subscribe and you'll be informed of any videos as I upload them. So now let's begin. So we'll begin with the materials. The most important materials are the paper and the paint. The paper I use is called Arches 640 gram and it's, the surface of it is called cold pressed. It's beautiful paper to work on. The colors that I use are the Windsor Newton I use the 14 mil tubes. The first one here is French ultramarine blue. The second one is cerulean blue. The third, yellow ochre. Next, aureolin, it's a beautiful, vibrant yellow. Next, cadmium yellow. I don't use much of that, but it's strong yellow. And then burnt sienna, which is a lovely tan color. And then the most beautiful red, it's called brown matter, even though it's actually red, but it's called brown matter. And another one that I really like to use sometimes is Windsor Violet. So that's the paint. Brushes, three, three brushes are fine really. This one, this one is, um, I think it's a number, it's, a, it's actually a number 16, but number 12, 14, 16 would do. And this is a number three and a number eight. I'm not that fussed about quality. Uh, I, I'll show you the names of these down in the description below, but some, as long as it's a watercolour brush, it's, it's, and it's okay, it kind of, it's not one of the very, very cheap ones, but you know, that's good enough. I use a sponge to take out little bits of water and put them into these little wells, because that's where I mix the colour. I put the little bits of paint on the edges and I mix up the little patches of colour in here. And um, I use this, this palette because I have it for years and years and I have got new ones, but I like this one because it's, it's like the islands around Ireland. It's broken away from the mainland over the years, but I like it. And so I still use that. I have two containers of water, one for washing the brush in and one for, as I just showed you, for taking the bits of color. Uh, I have a pencil and I have a kneadable rubber, which is a nice soft rubber. So now, I'll talk about the sketch. Now the place we're painting is called the Gap of Dunlow. It's a beautiful place outside Killarney in County Kerry in the southwest of Ireland. And it's just a couple of miles up the road from me, which is great. When I go out to begin a painting, I just do a sketch. And the sketch is just a brief sketch of what I want to paint. But most important are the patches of colour. And I just write down the patches of colour that I'm going to paint and I, the ones that I'm going to mix up in the little wells. And uh, that's so writing down the words in order to capture the light of the moment and the colours. That's the most important thing for me. Uh, now, at the end of this, if you want to download uh, the finished product, the, the actual painting, in order to have a go at it yourself, you're more than welcome in this instance. And, uh, but on the other hand, you might just use the techniques to recreate a, a landscape that you're familiar with. So now we'll begin and I'm going to just concentrate on the sky at first, just the sky and the technique for the sky is wet into wet. Well, this is my sketch. And this is the way I go about doing a painting. Now I'm not going to paint onto this page and don't worry, I'm sure you can't read anything. I can hardly read it myself, but I bring this piece of paper with me or a piece of paper on cardboard when I'm going to do a sketch of a place. And I think of everything as patches of color. So I do a brief sketch of the scene and then I just write in the names of the colors in the patches where I see them. So I'm going to just do the sky now. That's the first section. The second section will be the midground, which will be between here and down about here. And then finally, then I'll go from here down to here. So I'll deal with each of those separately. So now I'm going to make up the patches of color for the sky. So I have here, I've put an arrow for 
where the light is coming in, the direction of the light is very important. I have brown madder light. I have uh, French ultramarine, that's the blue. And I have grey over here. Now, the grey I make up from the French ultramarine, a little bit of the brown madder, and maybe a little bit of yellow ochre. So I now put this away where I can see it. It's like reading a book, really. I put it away where I can watch it and look at it, and I take my paper, which is my lovely Arches 640 gram paper that I actually love. I just want to say to you that normally I would have it at a slight slope like this, but that's not good for you. So I'm going to just put it down flat. It's got to do with the angle of the eye. Sometimes if you're drawing like this flat and it looks fine and then you put it up and it's kind of slanted and putting something under the back of it helps correct that. Now I'm going to make up those patches. So it's just a brown matter light, French ultramarine and gray. Remember there's no white in watercolor. And so the white is the white of the page. So don't be afraid to leave patches of white. It's like the light or the clouds or whatever coming through. And this is the way I put little bits of water in the little wells, put little bits like that in and then mix in the color. So first of all, French ultramarine is going in. Sometimes I might think that's a little bit severe, so I might put a tiny bit of, of red, a brown matter in. I'll keep a, a little test card like this too, so as you can see the color. I leave one, these, one of these is for washing the brush. Now I want brown matter. It's red, even though it's called brown, brown matter. It's a lovely color. It's kind of like a tomato red. I love it. It's not that sweetie pink red. It's a kind of a savory red. It's lovely, isn't it? I think that's gorgeous color. So that's pink in the sky. Now for the gray. We'll make up a, a gray up here. So I'll put in a good bit of, that's probably even a little bit too much. You want to make up enough to be able to dip the brush in, but you don't want, if you put in too much water, then you're just gonna be flooding it with paint. You'd be using too much paint. So I'm using that, that, and a little bit of yellow ochre. You could use burnt sienna as well in it, but you, just to make a nice gray. There are thousands of shades of gray, as, as we know from literature. Um, so that's the gray. Okay, so that's the colors we're going to be working with, plus the white of the page. Now, off we go. I'll rinse the brush in there. I'm going to wet the whole page. This is called, this technique is called wet into wet. And it does what it says on the tin. It means wet. Your page is wet. Sometimes if there's little dry bits, it actually makes, gives a nice effect. So that's, your washes are wet. Washes when you've water with a little bit of paint in it. The washes are wet, the, the page is wet. So this is wet into wet. Always remember to, you, oh, and the other thing was cerulean. I forgot because I have cerulean streaks in it too. So I'll put them in, that's a cerulean. Uh, so I'm going to use, the skies should not take you very long to do because you want to, a French ultramarine up here. And then my gray cloud over here. So you can put dark over light. I have, in the, in the sketch I have that there's mist as well coming down. So I'll, I'll, uh, oh. I'll just leave that down a bit like that. You can wet it, if it's getting a bit, if you want it to flow a bit more, you can put a little bit of water underneath it into the mountains. Now with the tip of a brush, I want to put in some cerulean streaks because, because the page is a little bit wet, you can almost, almost use it. Might use wet it a little bit more. Page isn't that. If, if the page gets too wet, too dry, this is a spray that you can actually put on as well, which just helps a little bit. Shouldn't take more, it shouldn't take long. The quicker you do the sky, usually the better it is. If small little dark things come up, just remove them with a bit of a brush. 
that. Okay, so I'll leave it at, I'll leave it at that and I will let that dry and then after that I'll go on to the midsection. Now the sky has dried and we're going on to the next section. I'll just show you here again now. We'll be doing this midsection here now. I don't have a lot of notes taken. I have silver there, which to me means French ultramarine mixed with a little bit of burnt sienna or something, but, uh, and blues. And then of course I've just drawn in shadows, so I'll put in bits of gray there. And then this is getting closer to us, so we'll use heavier colors. In other words, more paint. And uh, we have burnt sienna, I have heather, I have deep blues in there. So I'll make up those washes now. I'll make up those patches of color. I have bits of green in here as well. And uh, so I'll work from that. I'll just put this up in front of me again. Okay, so we'll make up the colors for this. Again, I'll take my color sheet. I have blue here. So I'm, I'm actually, I'm going to make burnt sienna. I'm going to mix it with that pink that I already have. Burnt sienna is this lovely tan color. And the mountains around here are old red sandstone and so when the particularly when the pinkish light shines in it you get this beautiful sandstone kind of so the, that's the brown matter that's just a little bit more burnt sienna uh, the blue I can use this blue I might water it down a little bit or I might just um, make a little bit of that and water it down a bit too you can water it down by Sometimes I don't even think of what I'm going to do. I just mix them as I go along. Might make a tiny bit of green. That's the aureolin, this yellow aureolin. Tiny, tiny bit of French ultramarine in it, does that? A little bit. And then water, because it's far away. So when it's far away, there's more atmosphere between you and the color, which means more water. In watercolor, it means more water because you're diluting the color with atmosphere and a little bit of blue. Things get bluer when they're in the distance, so you have this very pale color. Then we have our, still have our gray. Might make a little bit more gray. Just put a little bit of that in it. Put, add in a bit of French ultramarine, a bit of burnt sienna. So now that's a very heavy gray. We'll maybe, maybe make a couple of mid grays there as well. Okay, so now I'll do this, the mountain in the background first. So I'll start. Start with your light colors. I'm going to come in with this. Maybe make it a little bit paler. This burnt sienna. This, but now you can see sometimes that you paint through things and watercolor is transparent. Um, but I think it's kind of nice, ethereal looking, when you see that. Um, now, you can see I'm putting bits of blue in through it to run through it like shadows, and that is quite blue anyway. You can put a little bit of green going up there. Bits of shadow come down there, down the mountain. Now, I have here that there's a bit of mist coming in. So what you can do for the mist is you can get a very clean, very clean brush and you can wet, wet the sky. Remember, the sky is dry now, so you're getting very clean water and just wetting a bit of it. And so as it'll be more effective, get a nice bit of dark paint. You can actually remove a bit. So for contrast, then you just... Right? See how they, they just blend lovely when you put them beside each other. So this isn't wet into wet. It's actually wet onto dry. But you're, you're, you're still putting them beside each other. So you're, you're not actually... You know, you're not actually letting them dry. If, if I was to do a little bit over here, and then go and do a little bit over here, then this would dry and you'd get that hard edge. But when you keep going and um, keep it up. So now I've got a higher mountain range coming down here. So I'm going to just bring that down. Now 
And again, you can take a bit of mist away from, into that as well. Just wet the edge. Gives that misty look. Okay, I'm going to bring some more, some more sandstone. <laughs> So the mid-greens now, I want to make them stronger. Mix little bits of yellow ochre, blue, to darken it. This is the boring part for you to watch now, but it's um, essential. In fact, with watercolor, the majority of your time is actually spent mixing colors. So if you think of when vegetation is far away from you, it's all different colors because there's shadows going through it. There's bits of, could be little bits of gorse in it. There could be anything at all in it. Little bits of gorse, ah, reminds me, little bits of gorse. I might put out some cadmium yellow. But you can see how I keep going from wet to, be, to the bit that's beside it, rather than letting, letting places dry. And you, you can just put in shadows, bits of shadows there too. It's a little bit of gorse we can put on. With go gorse is that lovely yellow plant we have here all the time. We have it, it blooms all year round. Mostly the flowers get bigger in summer, but it blooms all year round. In fact, there's a saying that says that gorse goes out of bloom when kissing goes out of fashion. In other words, it doesn't. I'm getting some dark greens in around the gorse. See, with gorse bushes, you can just put the dark around the yellow, put the yellow for, first, because with watercolor, light comes first, and then you put dark around it. If that was an oil painting, you could put the greenery down first and put little dabs of yellow on, but um, with um, watercolor, you have to think ahead. You have to be ahead of the game, and you have to do your light colors first. I have written in my notes that there's some heather, so I might just put out a little bit of purple for the heather. This is kind of rocky area here, so that's why I'm that's why I'm leaving that there. I'll show you how I do with that in one minute. So you can put the dark over the light at all times to create bits of shadow and that. Now with the rock, I'm going to use, the, the rock is kind of, you know, it's kind of whitish blue rock, but you can dry brush. This is called dry brushing, where, so this is another technique. So we had wet into wet in the sky. We had wet onto dry for the mountains. And now we're doing a little bit of dry brushing just to get the texture in, in the rocks. You can make it very dark in places. Obviously it's going to be darker right under the vegetation. I'm just using any bits of dark paint I can get there. It doesn't really matter. Probably when we're doing the water's edge, we'll probably go back and change that a little bit, but for now it's all right. Bit of burnt sienna to just give it a bit of, see how a little bit of burnt sienna there, or a different color just can give it a little bit of life as well. Reds do that as well too. Reds are lovely for, you want dark in under where the, where the vegetation is hanging over the rocks. You want a little bit of dark in there. I have two sheep down here at the front too, so hopefully, <laughs> hopefully they won't get lost. Because sheep will remain white, but I'll just sort of paint around them because as I say, there is no white. We don't use white. I don't use white anyway. There is a type of white, a gouache or something that people use, but better off not to.
Because the light is coming in this way, this is going to be more in shadow. So this is going to be a little bit darker. This is the beginning, we're now painting the beginning of the McGillicuddy Reeks. Our highest mountain, Carinthul, is in this mountain range. It's just over a couple of miles from there. And we'll put in a little bit of sandstone. Now, I'm going to run the um, grass down into it, put a little bit of heather coming down the side of it. I've used a little bit of cadmium there to lighten the green. Leave the little path. Horses and traps go up this road all the time. Now we'll do the other side of the road. There's a bridge here, I forgot to say that, you might have seen the bridge. I don't want to do the, I don't want to paint the bridge until I'm sure that everything is dry there, so I might just leave the bridge when I'm connecting with, when I'm connecting it up with the foreground. So I might just leave it there for a little minute and uh, until this area dries. Okay, so the sky is dry now, which is more than we can say sometimes for outside the window, but it is dry. And the midground is dry, so now we're going on now to the lake and the foreground here. And we're going to try and keep these two little sheep clean. And uh, there's another way of doing the sheep. We could actually paint them in uh, liquid rubber uh, masking fluid and uh, then remove it afterwards, but I'm not going to do that. I'm going to just... Um, leave it, just avoid them. So the first thing I think I'll put in is the, the bridge. So I just need some sort of a dark color there. I'll try with something that I've already done. It's kind of a gray that I made for the sky. This is called Water Lily Lake, that's sick. it's beautiful. Don't like what I did there. You can just remove it a little bit like that with the damp brush. As we get a little bit darker, probably down near the edge. Always think of that, that where the shadows are, things get darker. So when that's going into the vegetation there, it'll be a little bit darker. So if you ever come to Killarney, you make a wish going over that bridge. Okay, so we'll show some of the land going behind the bridge. And then we're going to do a little bit of dry brushing down here as well now, just for an effect of the water. Again, dry brushing is when you're just using the, the side of the brush and it's like as if you're cleaning off something, trying to get something off the brush. Well, you are you're trying to get the paint off it. So we'll, Use a kind of a blue gray color and just. Okay, so now we're going to, we could darken that path a little bit as well too with just anything really. It's not really, it's too bright. Okay, so now we're going to do the water. Now, the thing about water, when you're painting water, it has to vary. It can vary from back to front, from side to side, but it has to vary. The light is shining on it. There is 
um, darkness, uh, there's vegetation under it sometimes. If I was to paint that all one color, it just would look like as if it was falling out of the painting. So when you're doing a painting, you're doing something, you're working on something two-dimensional, but you're creating an illusion of something three-dimensional. And so there are things you have to do, and that's one of them. So it has to be different in some way. Uh, it's an, I'll make up some more washes up here, but at first, just to show you a little bit more of how you can use dry brushing. There's a little bit of bluey gray on the brush here now, and I could just dry brush across there, which so shows like a little shimmer on the water up there. Uh, I'm going to use some of this burnt sienna. I'm going to use maybe a little bit, you can make up different, different shades of blues and greens and browns and everything that's in that water. Did I say, okay, that's a bit of, or actually what's really good is to put a, a little bit, get a little bit of it where you have a tiny bit of aureolin in it as well. Just, there's always that little bit of green in waters as well lake water and sea water as well, of course. Oops, it goes the spongy in. Yeah? I'm going to make that slightly green. And that's blue. That's very dark. So, so make sure you have a few, a few different washes made up. You can even make a nice bit of burnt sienna that I have that I have there that can go into it in some way. Now, I know I have, thing, I'm re reading my notes again here where I have green area, dark blue area. Um, sometimes I don't take very good notes. I just do it some other way. So I'm putting in a bit of, but the one thing you don't have is that it's always one color. It never is one color. Maybe use a bigger brush. more places where there's land going out into the water as well. Actually, there's little water lily pads there as well too. I kind of forgot about them actually. You can dab them off. So this is another Technique, an opportunity for another technique, lads. All right, removing little bits of paint. So what you do there is you get a very nice light green. And you can put little lily pads in there. Water lily pads. Bit of water coming out there. Okay, so now we're going to make up some of the little bits of land going out into the into the lake. So we've made up some yellow ochre. We're going to make up some more green using the aureolin and the French ultramarine. They make up that aureolin is fantastic for making greens. It's um, one of the more expensive paints, and lemon yellow is almost as good as it. But I like the aureolin. But lemon yellow was quite good. I'm being a bit fussy. The best part of painting, the best paintings come from when you're enjoying the touch of the brush on the paper. If you're kind of going manically at it like this and taking in the whole thing and trying to do everything, you know, just relax and really enjoy the touch of the brush on the paper because it's lovely. And don't be too fussy about this is wrong or this is right. It can be anything. And you can put little, little dark bits through it just to, there's always little shadows. Where the vegetation touches the water, there's always darkness because think about it, there's bits falling over into the water and there's shadow there. So the shadow is there and the shadow will also go down into the water as well. 
one out. And I'm putting shadow under the grass there because this is the side you see. You don't see the edge of that side. You see the edge of this side. You don't see the edge of that side. So think about that. There's a fair bit of logic involved in painting as well, although it's something that I'm not particularly known for. But when it comes to this particular small piece of the world, this rectangle, I'm very logical. Everything else is chaos. I'm just making up, sorry if I'm going ahead without telling you what I'm doing. I just, um, I'm mixing more dark here with the French ultramarine, the burnt sienna, and I had a little bit of the Oriolan in it as well. So you get that lovely, lovely dark green. It's almost black. I don't use black at all. Never, ever, ever. You get all the black you want from, from burnt sienna mixed with French ultramarine, you get as black as you want with that because you, there, there is black, but it's very dull, dull as your painting. So I could have, have I purple there somewhere? I have a purple down here and there's some cadmium yellow. So I'm just going to go at it here now with, um, I could wet a bit of it there. mix a bit of yellow. You can mix them up with uh, as you're going to. You don't have to um, you don't have to use all Oriolan or bits of purple going through it. And bits of the dark. I'll show you a little trick here now as well too. This dark that I have here now is quite strong, right? So with this part of your brush, this part of your brush here, you can actually skite up little bits of grasses. Always bring them up from the dark though, because there's always shadows underneath those little rushes, if you know what I mean. It's all little tricks. Watercolor is a lot of little tricks actually. There's lots of little tricks to, to learn in watercolor like that. And remember, think what way the light's coming. The light's coming from west to east, sunset. And so you want the shadows going this way. This is called dry brushing as well. You can put on little bits of um, trees and things with the side of your brush. So you're putting a fair amount of brush, paint on your brush, but you're just, and you're using the whole side of your brush. You're using right down to here. You're holding your, your brush, your hand fairly, almost touching the paper. And again, remember we said you do the light color first, so then we need to get some dark blue mixed with a bit of Oriolan and paint in the little bits of vegetation around the gorse bushes rather than the other way around. If you paint the dark green first, you're not going to see, you're not going to see the yellow on top of it. You can also do bits of, that, of what I was saying a minute ago, rushes and that, long grasses with the point, with the point of a, a, a little brush. You can do that too. It doesn't have to be the other way I showed you. Now, up the gap, it's nearly all black-faced sheep, which is lucky for me because they're a lot easier to paint. More defined. Okay, so I'm going to put the specs kind of looking over his shoulder a bit. Let's see, back of him here now. The legs. This fella's eating some grass.
they're not at all afraid of people. They're not that friendly, I mean, they wouldn't be coming over to you, but they're used with people being up there. Okay, so I put on the enough to let you see they have legs and they have heads, so they're passively sheep. But the other thing you have to do is anything that's three-dimensional, there's a place on them that isn't getting the light and a place that is getting the light. And that's, at the moment, they're very flat looking. So you need a bit of shadow, a little bit of blue or any kind of shadow. Can you see now how that, ju that just makes that little bit of a difference in them? This fellow's fading into the background a bit, so we'll have to wait, maybe wait till he dries a little bit. a lily pad pads you can put a little bit of shadow under them there on the side where you'll see them you again don't put shading all around them because you don't see where they hit the water on the other side if you know what I mean now there could be Okay, so that's it, really. You can be forever. You can be forever fixing up little parts of it. I mean, that goes on and on. I have a friend whose daughter used to come in and take a photograph of her painting and say, Mom, I'm going to take a photograph of it before you wreck it. So here I am now about to wreck it. So I'll stop now. So that's it. That's the gap of Dunlow and watercolours. Well, that was my painting of the gap of Dunlow. I hope you enjoyed it. And I really hope you got something out of it. If you did, please like the video as it helps the channel grow. If you have any queries whatsoever, leave a comment in the section below and I'll do my best to respond to it. I'm going to elaborate on these techniques and much more in further videos. So don't forget to subscribe so you won't miss out. See you soon.